Uh, Madam Chairman, uh, fellow citizens of Gloucester, I really miss all the uh, fishermen at this uh, city hall. I really miss them. Could you just give your name and address for the record, please? My name is Vincent Farini. I live at 126 East Main Street. I pass by day and night, no one has seen me. If you ever want to find me and know me, leave behind yourself and enter the caves of other people. There you will find me who is yourself. We live in a schizoid society, heart split from head. And what I want to do all through my life, which I have been doing all through my life, is to show that there is no disunity, that I'm a unified self. Being a unified self, I'm the poem, I'm the work of art, I'm the art of living. There's no separation. Once you understand that there's no separation, then uh, you realize that the uh, the living process is the art itself. So when you're in touch with that, you're where you want to be. I am thrust out of my mother's womb with pencil in my left hand, intoxicated with all these visions before and behind coming at me, all in the palm of my right fist, my working hand. I don't take anything for granted and never will. The tenement I am born in has a placard, worn out, torn, weather-beaten like the clabbards, but the writing is still legible. When will the long feud end? The ink of the letters has come from the marrow of my parents and from all families in poverty throughout the ages, whether of the body or spirit. A voice out of this chaos booms out. You are going to conform, you little bastard, or we are going to make your life miserable. You cannot disentangle Lloyd Vincent from his writing. The poem is his day's work. That day's poem is that day's work. For that day, that poem is Vincent Farini. You can't separate the two, and it's a terrible mistake to separate the two. You're losing. The poem and Vincent are both losing if you try to separate them. It is possible to take a lot of Vincent's uh, poems by standard uh, academic procedures and pick all sorts of holes in them. That is completely missing the point of someone like Vincent. When you open a volume of Vincent's poems and read in them, uh, you're dealing with Vincent the Man on every single page. This house is holier than a temple. It is where I live and have my being. This house of bone and blood, molded by the weathers of experience, is all I have. This house, after this house, which is me only, is dust, I will be in your house. To, to give your life over to poetry the way, the way Vincent has, without, with no thought whatsoever of material gain, with, with, uh, with, with, with very little uh, uh, concern about, about, about fame, uh, simply uh, 
simply publishing uh, his works uh, when he couldn't, by himself, when he couldn't find publishers, continuing writing uh, uh, long after, in age, uh, most people uh, would have given up uh, writing. I think it's, a, it's tremendous. It's a tremendous thing in the community. I mean, when I was 14 or 15 or 16, when I was reading Vincent, I was looking for a way to express things that were inside me, that, 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 that couldn't come out. Uh, the poetry that we read in school, Wordsworth, uh, Longfellow, it, it, it was meaningless to me. And so when I read Vincent's poetry that was sharp uh, and, and the imagery was tough, it was, it was stunning, it was a tremendous experience. The factories, sunsets splash blood in our broken eyes and the moon splinters. Dead, we are huge and ugly with derelict canyons between. Our floors empty as Sunday, abandoned by the bosses and a few abusing us. Our skeleton teeth locked on the sky. Workers, it is not our fault you starve, idle without purpose. Workers, resurrect us. Put life back into our hollow bodies. Let us breathe again, and the word fired be a nightmare that died with the past, and for the first time own your jobs. The union to operate us for the good of the people and the profits divided among you to build a city of love. When I was a child, I uh, witnessed a lot of poverty. Uh, my parents were on welfare and I had to go to get the, the food they offered and uh, I had a see quarrels between my parents. Uh, it was a very difficult time. And uh, as I grew uh, older and I went to school, I uh, found myself uh, uh, not at ease with school. I kind of hated school. Uh, they didn't tell me things that uh, were dealing with my life. School was a bore because uh, they told us uh, that we had to read such and such a, a book and then we had to report on the book. Well, I mean, to report on what was in the book was kind of ridiculous. And so we wanted to tell our stories, but the teacher said, your stories are not important. You've got to get the story from the book and tell it to us. I says, I'm not interested in reading a story from the book and giving it to you back. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's secondhand stuff. You've got to hear the stories we're going to tell you. And they said, no. The teacher said, nothing doing. We're not interested in your stories. I said, well, you can take the school and stick it up your ass. And that was it, man. Sunday, I swim the whole length of the beach, four miles. I accost this girl in the ocean over our heads. We shed our trunks. Ah, the cunt. It is as rubbery as the salt brine. I feel like kelp. I discover the healing properties here. Immortality is in the ocean. The cells in my body crave the sex of it and the deeps of my unfound mind. In 17, I was still in school. I went to the Lynn Public Library. When I stepped in that building, and I saw all the books around there, wow, I says, my God, all the stuff that's in here, all the words telling us so many things about life. I says, maybe I'm gonna find the answers why there's poverty in America, why we don't get along. So I became a bookworm. And there were two uh, kids, two guys, 18, 19, sitting over uh, in the reading room, and he told me a story. He says, look at those two guys. One is a guy named Joe Rittano, who has money, and he's just got out of high school, and he wanted to go, he could have gone to BU, but his friend, this kid named Vincent Farini, hasn't got any money, and he can't go. So they decided, they took the school curriculum, and they decided to go down the library and take classes. So they'd read biology for an hour uh, and sit at the bench and then they'd read 
other books, you know. I mean, an appropriate day uh, of college instruction, which they got themselves out of the books. I hunt, a fanatic for answers to my questions. The public library becomes my step home. I meet the great dead, engaging them in long conversations. I can't get enough books to show me why things are as they are, why there are so many poor people and all the wealth is in the hands of the few. The Chinese give me a balanced diet of art and living. Kropotkin and Engels, an understanding of the structure of man and society. The ancient Greeks tell me it is possible to have a sound mind and a sound body in a sound society. An angel lived in me, and when I first came to the library, I looked up in the sky and I saw her, that angel outside me, telling me what was inside me, outside me. I read and write from dawn till midnight. My parents think I am going cuckoo. In my excavations, I meet Jesus Christ. I am electrified. The examples of his life stays in my marrow. The heavenly city is real. A series of poems that he wrote about the Depression are absolutely unique. And it's a great tragedy that no smoke and the other ones are out of print. Because I always tell people, if you want to recapture that feeling, because here he was, you know, an unemployed worker, no prospect. None of us, see, that's the irony. None of us had any future as workers or as executives or as businessmen. So what do we do? We, as, we aspire to the highest. I wanted to be Tolstoy and he wanted to be a, a great poet, you see. And, and the, it, it allowed that. We had nothing but our fantasies. We had no prospects. So we didn't have to go to school and learn to be a computer person or learn to welding or something. There's no goddamn jobs welding. So what did we try to learn? We tried to learn to be great geniuses. <laughs> D.H. Lawrence makes a wonderful statement and he says, uh, you know, the successful life is somebody who transforms a community that lives in a living, breathing, believing community and tries to transform it. And Vincent, in a sense, transformed Lynn into a poem. The city. 15 years ago, this city was the shoe hub of the world. 160 factories hummed a song of joy. Jobs were so plentiful you tripped over them. And our families had happiness. Today, the city is a graveyard of factories, monumental tombstones accusing with broken eyes, a jungle of death pregnant with another life. And we shoe workers idly mushroom the union halls arguing. Skeptical of the future, we talk of the past, of the crowded union meetings, the honest speeches inspiring guts to sacrifice monster demonstrations and the unbreakable strikes. Six months ago, the last giant factory said, accept a 20% cut. The union answered, no. The boss grabbed his shop and settled out of state, leaving 1,700 families stranded. The union caved in. At dawn, Buses and cars carry shoe workers to faraway open shop towns. And we thousands remaining huddled in tenements starve in the shadows of dead factories. You get the picture? Real, tense, still alive. Still alive. <laughs> World War II began, and of course, Vincent and I both got jobs at the GE. 
And it's the first time we'd been gainfully employed in our lives. <laughs> they give me a badge with a face on it and a job as a bench hand in building 32, polishing buckets for jet planes. Guards stand at all entrances and exits. A liquid mass of sleepwalkers crawling in. A boy pulls his loaded newspaper cart as if it is a bad dream. Headlines drop depth bombs on us. The guard at the gate is a sunflower or a tower of ice. One time I met this man and he gave me a copy of uh, a magazine called Man, which was an anarchist journal. I read it. I enjoyed it very much. And then one day I met this other man and he said, uh, you've been reading that uh, anarchist journal? And he says, yeah. I says, yeah. I said, yeah. I says, okay. He says, well, read this. So he handed me the Daily Worker. And I read it and uh, I enjoyed it. It covered uh, situations uh, that's going on every day uh, in America and all over the world. So he saw me a week after, he said, well, he says, uh, how do you like it? I said, it's a fine paper. He said, how about joining? I said, okay. So I joined it. I joined the Communist Party. Faith in the party is religious. Man must believe he cannot live without hope. They and the Catholic Church are so much alike and rooted in dogma. I go along because they are trying to change the world but I know that the real answers have been laid down with the founding of the nation. Then I'd go and Vincent, uh, visit Vincent over in this vast uh, factory, vast building. And he, he was unhappy there. And he wrote these poems about going to the factory, you know, people with faces on their lapels, and uh, they were sharp and, and marvelous, and, but tragic. And then he'd have an alternate mood. He'd say, you know, the job unstops the womb. You know, the phallus is raining. Forge plant! Insects with antlers and iron shoes. Their eyes peer out of asbestos boxes. Pushing to tons dark, red as sunrise. To be cut and shaped by nine ten electric hammers. Black workers, white workers, looking alike with dirt and oil. And the women in amber rooms, polishing, cutting, filing, and the fussy jobs of grinders at the edge of the storm. Look how they feed the hot metal into mighty intestines, pounding them into molds in a shower of stars needing thunder and lightning and the strength and secrets of the universe like gods at the bins of forges wetting the bird feet with swab by the trigger thud 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 for oh, workers nothing is impossible for you pounders of the tongues of ships the guts of holocaust Unconscious, O oh workers of your genius, and now wielding your power and grasp like giants. Energies paid by war. Why have you never worked like this in peacetime? Well, it feels as though uh, my body's amputated and I'm having trouble walking around. There are big gaps of emptiness. Right behind me is where Hunt's restaurant used to be. That was our meeting place during the Depression. We get together at noontime and then in the evening. It's no longer there. Down the street there, Washington Street, a lot of homes are gone.
feels very strange. Well, what I like about it is that this is springtime. And it's beginning to uh, have an effect on me. I see all these signs on the metal bridge and they remind me of my youth. The past doesn't mean anything except for those who lived and still live in the present. Here I am, solidly fixed in this town with branches. The difficult thing about language is that sometimes poets miss the sense of three tenses. The three tenses are involved with the past, the present, and the future. Insofar as we find ourselves in a place where we can expand and affect ourselves and all those with whom we mingle, something very mysterious happens. That's where I function, from that center inside people. And I'm like one of God's spies, looking around, see what's going on, so I can write it down and they can use it or affect those that I touch so that they are affected and then it spreads out. I find it uh, interesting in, uh, in reading Vincent's autobiography, which I recently have, uh, how he came out of the uh, shoe factories and the uh, General Electric factory in Lyon, but it's somehow where, where and in what way this outer town of Gloucester, this fishing town, caught his imagination. Uh, I don't think he actually goes into that in the book, but somehow or other this, this town of Gloucester became a uh, became a dream place for him, a place that he was going to make his place. And he eventually did. First time I came to Gloucester to discover the peninsula here, I went to the rocks. I walked all the way down, all the way down. I made the bend over there. And who did I see? I saw this young, bare-ass, Woman looking out to the Atlantic Ocean. Did you have you seen her? Right there. Yeah, where? You can see her from here. Good, good eyesight, Joe. It was closed in. It was like a uh, well, it's like a bird resting and I could feel its beat all by itself. But then it was night too, and I looked at the shape of the streets and the houses, and I got a feeling that it was a small place. And I just like the sense of it. I don't know what it was, but I was, I was as though some invisible angel came and, and stuck a needle in me. I felt something. My whole system changed. I said, I gotta come here. I got work to do here. Luminaries, they talk about your light in Sicily and Crete. They see you as a sister because you too have an aureole of seawater. And the town's crystal is a whole rainbow you wear in your hair. The birds go racing for your strands. The seniors on Main Street benches count the memories when they courted you in Dogtown, on a finger pier, on a Venus wavelength, when she threw her net over the two of you and somehow problems had solutions. When the sun lifted you off the ground and it floated in your eyes. The light has your skin tone and whoever has a date with you is forever enchanted with the breasts of your ears. Musk violet are your eyebrows, the streets your heels tap, 
a wobbly from too much of your alcohol, the brain's patina. Even newsboys and girls remember the changing of the light. Their souls are stained by a mood of the ineffable they cannot define that comes on after the first engagement, watching the morning, the afternoon, and evening in their palms, and you did nothing but pass through them. No wonder pedestrians are off-center and the workers on the wharves. They, too, glisten with your aureole. My brother Dante buys a house that was once a bar room. In the back is a small frame shop. I rent it and become a frame maker. Framing comes natural. In high school, I had been given a prize for being the best student in the manual arts. The little shop is 12 by 16 feet. No heating, no insulation, a plain wooden shell. My work table, a slab of granite above the tide. I am here every day and twilight of the year. Winters, the floor is an arctic. And summers, my face rains. I hear one of my customers, Rabbi Shapiro. You are a poet with golden hands. One cannot see one's life until it is down on paper and it jumps up at you from far away, a satellite and a Geiger counter. I live from frame to frame, customer by customer, but I have one ace. I can pause when the poem is hot within and demands airing. That's it. Eleven, phosphorescence. I pull the plug out at five, and all the night birds start whistling in my ears. Trade is arrested. My hands forget the table. I'm in the bell-throated song. The stars sway, and the tower quivers among them, spying out the black spaces in the music. The night is ours, and so are the throbbing arrivals and the lucky squalls. The dog bars red flame, a bird's eye hub to the wheeling lives. The harbor is a lost scarf of the disembarking fishermen and an old door, now as the returning sea. This diamond less than a ball field, a telescope mound and a microscope mind. The beach sand and heather listening around it. These and the awakened beam furtively curious as if looking is all. The very fact that a person who is considered to be a poet, and as such in the popular mind, uh, a kind of an ivory tower figure or a figure apart from the ordinary uh, activities uh, of humankind, has not only written uh, letters, really I would say dozens, almost hundreds of letters on every possible kind of relevant local subject, not only but have written letters, but, but actually come out in public to speak, to, to participate uh, in, uh, in political activities. I think it's, it's, it's helped local people understand that poetry isn't something of the study, of the ivory tower, of the closet, that, that, that a poet is a person living in the world, uh, uh, actually engaging uh, the world. And, you know, the popular mind sees poets as writing about nature. Uh, Poets do write about nature. They write about how people feel, how people think, what, what hurts people, uh, what's, what destroys nature, what destroys people. I mean, Vincent has, has done that. I have a few words to say to all of you and all of us. Fishing is our core life, and the waterfront is our original signature. So we guard against the wildfire greed that will destroy this harbor of the working class, and we will know what kind of a storm this is. Will property owners resist these seductions of megabucks 
and save their birthrights and the communities? Beware of becoming barracudas. It's one ocean. I say it is not only fishing you will kill, but Christ himself, the fisher of souls in ourselves. Fishing's high and low tides are in our solitary hearts. Some boats go down, but most continue arriving loaded to the gills. Though we still have to reckon with scarcities and quotas, the Canadians and the breeding grounds, fishing carries on in spite of these tragedies and comedies we are heir to. Will the homeowners and processors around the harbor sell out to the developers for a quick fortune? Betraying Howard Blackburn, Centennial Johnson, the valiant captains, every drowned fisherman, Charlie Lowe, Gordon Thomas, Charles Olson, Philip Weld, and others? Do you think the steel of the Gloucester fishers are a thing of the past only? Think again. This gutting the genius of Gloucester for a condo city? I say we must not permit the death of our city as it has been known for over 350 years. And as we know it personally, we must fight with imagination with all our resources, our dedication and courage to protect tomorrow's today by keeping the acute senses of fishing alive. Remember, one drop of seawater is the whole of it. The whole of it, one drop. All things are loaned to us. Private liberty is exercised by community responsibility. We are a new fisher people, the sum of social individuals and intelligence of the other ocean. I say, fight for this town because it's worth it. That's the poem. You get it? That's the living poem. Mm -hmm. See, when I tell people I'm not a poet, I'm the poem. You get it? Mm -hmm. I'm not a, I may be, my, my writings may be on a paper, on the book, but I am the poem. Because right. a book is just a piece of uh, cloth, pages, and, 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 and print. You see the difference? So it takes a mouth and tongue to take the, the, the words off the pap paper and put it into the atmosphere or get it into your ears. So poetry, or anything that's alive, is, is crucial to uh, whatever happens, and that's where I am. I'm with the thing in motion. I have the world and all its creatures. Dear to me is the idiom of their natures. Simple. <laughs> I think Benson at times tries to project a self-image as, well, certainly he's, he projects the self-image as the proletarian poet, the poet of the working man, the poet of the people. You can make a very simple uh, little comment, like, uh, well, sure, he's the, he likes to think of himself as the poet of the people, the poet of the common man, the poet of the peasant, and so on. What's the common man doing nowadays? He's sitting home watching television, for goodness sake. He's not reading Vincent Farini. Vincent Farini's appeal doesn't literally go to the people he pretends to speak for. The gold, the suddenness flowers have, startle the air with their fire and ether as we do with what is ours, because we are the gardeners of each other.
represents the most wonderful time of my whole philosophy. Tell you why. could have their fantasies realized like I am right now, the whole world would change. They say he is obsessed with sex, but the universe is in an uninterrupted state of intercourse and having a delightful time, and it is free for anyone. But, at a, but as I said, the master and the slave have one habitat who swap places. Now you know where you are at. <laughs> Vincent came to me desperate and for a job. And he walked in with Preacher Richards or whatever his name is across the street <laughs> and a bag of books in Salem jail for an interview. And he said, Here's my box. And he emptied 20 thousand books on the table off out of a paper bag. And he said, I'm for the community, and the community's for me. I'm a lover. I'm a dancer. I'm a musician. I'm a poet. And I'm a lover. And the best thing about it is I do it all at the same time. Hire me. So we hired him. And I noticed Vinny out on the green lawn with his hair like smoke. Later on, back in his little shack here, he was the first one who got me to speak uh, pre-verbal language. I love that <laughs> <laughs> And you want me to read the first paragraph? Yeah. yeah. Only one condition. I'll read the first paragraph if I read the last paragraph. And you can tear out all the pages in between. <laughs> the first paragraph is, I am thrust out of my mother's womb with a pencil in my left hand. That's not the whole paragraph. That's the first sentence and the first paragraph. And then? The last sentence is, life is the poem. That's all you need to know. Okay, we'll throw the rest of it away. <laughs> throw the rest away. <laughs> then fill it in with your own life. You understand what I'm saying? I'm only a medium. Uh -huh. Passing on words to help you come into the emptiness that I contain. A Buddhist, by God. <laughs> well, I have a poem called uh, The Sea and Ourselves at Cape Ann, which I wrote in... Uh, um, right outside of Gloucester, and uh, it mention, mentions uh, Vincent Farini, and it says, uh, and Farini took the wind's clothes and became the conscience of Gloucester. And uh, the poem also mentions Robert Creeley and uh, Charles Olson, who uh, lived in uh, Gloucester many years. But what I meant by Vincent Farini becoming the conscience of Gloucester, it seemed to me he's become uh, more associated with Gloucester than either Olson and certainly than Creeley, and he becomes more of a, uh, at the heart and soul of Gloucester itself, he's a local poet in the best sense of the word. The importance of place it's something that's peculiar to a lot of American writers, I think. It has a lot to do with uh, the whole American experience. We are still relatively a young country, a new country. And, but there's been such a tr tremendous amount of movement in this country, the whole movement west and so on. And the need to find an anchor, to find some place. This is my place. This is home. This is what I root myself on. Vincent is a local poet, but he's not a regional poet. By saying, applying the word local in that sense, uh, I don't mean that he's uh, limited strictly to that area. He has simply chosen to make that his focus. So, I mean, Vincent uh, Farini in his best poems gets beyond the, the local. Uh, 
because he, in his best poetry he transcends all that. Even though it's still in the lingo of Gloucester, it's still in the Gloucester accent. Kate Banny, how many times have I massaged your toes, your ankles, your calves, your thighs, your waist, your fingers, your arms, your tits and buttocks, your throat, your eyes, and your head, and each engagement astonishing me? Vincent does have obsessive energy. He has an obsessive... Uh uh, engagement with the joy of just getting up and working and being alive every day and having a job to do, having a battle to fight, having someone to write a great letter to, whatever the occasion. And he attacks every day just like that with, uh, with uh, you know, unflagging energy. The Giants versus the Cardinals. And the best part of the game was these young women walking with tight dungarees. I'm telling you, it was absolutely beautiful. Who won the game, Betty? The game was won by those women carrying their dungarees tightly between their legs. That's where the game was won. That was the best part of my trip to San Francisco. Yeah, there was one woman there, I'm telling you, I could have devoured her. Imagine these poets that are successful and get drunk. What would they give if somebody came to them and said, look, I can give you the fame of a Robert Lowell and you can die in a crazy house, but I'll give you that gift of Farini's who over 70 gets up every morning and starts a poem. I mean, that's the greatest gift of all. Creativity is the greatest gift we can have. You know what the sad? I feel as though I am not being used. Used, all my potentials are not being used. It's like Olson when he died. He wanted 10 more years. Truman Nelson in Newburgh Report, he's, he's 73 years old. He wants to be used. He's at the point in his life, he's the most powerful and beautiful point of his life. He's not being used. All his learning, all his experiences, all his talent, his genius is, is stopped. It's not being used. Why aren't people's geniuses being used? Why? I'm so fucking angry about it. It's sad. It's sad. Because it's, 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 it, they, 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 they just want to show you what life is, what love is. Love. All over the world, they got these armaments ready to destroy, destroy life off the earth. Imagine what that is, to destroy life off the earth. And there are people who go along and, 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 and say, well, the Russians are our enemies and we're their enemies. Something's crazy. The world is crazy. Don't people know what love is, what love can do? Love can break all kinds of barriers. Music, I see a kind of a music that, oh my God, I can hear this music here. You know what it would do? It would take all these fucking atom bombs apart. The music would strike them and they'd dissolve. Strike them and dissolve. All the battleships, strike them and dissolve. All the submarines, strike them and dissolve. Everything would dissolve on the basis of this music of love. Are people up to that? The book. Who is singing with the gold thread? The fishes. Our nature is the metamorphosis of the unimagined. She is the poem. It's difficult to be a walking lighthouse and have uh, popularity. You notice that all lighthouses are alone. 
And as people uh, move into their own dimensions, they too become alone. And people don't want to travel alone. And yet they are essentially alone. And now you see that light that's flashing around? Huh? The light is in my eyes as it flashes around, or in your eyes as it flashes around. And what do you catch? Do you catch the bullshit, or do you catch the things that are significant to you? And we're all going to the movies, we're all going to the churches, we're all going someplace to find out what's going on. Here it is. Hey, it's coming down. Let's go. Gloria. Oh, Gloria, I love you. Say. Yeah, but death is a big meal. Morato. Everybody's a poet. Chico. If you don't find a place, you don't have a history. Oro. I says, your wife, she's a poem. Everything is one, but you can't see it. You can't see it because our eyes are distracted by millions and millions and billions of things. But actually, it's all one. Now, to be able to see it as one means that uh, you have to kind of... Uh, Die to yourself as a personality, drown in the ocean, and look with the eye of the ocean. Now, that sounds a little crazy. Is the ocean an eye? I don't know. Maybe it is. But at least the ocean is all itself. And if the ocean is itself, so is the cosmos itself. Between the gray sea and the overburdened sky, a seagull and a man dived into the water that was chopping the air and swam four fathoms under. And when they came back to the rock dripping with autumn water, the seagull was the man and the man the gull. Poets can say things that prose writers can't say. They can do things that prose writers can't do. They can educate people in the way that prose readers, uh, writers can't, can't do it. And they can make, have, give people a particular kind of vision. They can share a particular vision with people like Vincent does. A poet sees things differently. For instance, if I'm dancing, that's the poem. If I'm making love, that's the poem. If I'm talking with you, that's the poem. But that is part of the whole business. In other words, I'm taking away the emphasis upon poetry as a special category. It's not a special category. It's a heightening of the process of awareness. And it's exciting. And that keeps me alive. People tend to separate. You can't separate the air. The air is one. Well, human beings are one. They think they're separated, but they really aren't separated. Once you have that consciousness that everything is one, that we're all connected, and we're all interdependent, once you're at that, at that frequency, everything changes. Everything reaches a pitch in your life that becomes exciting. Not only that, you move in the direction where suddenly you're a magician to your life, magician to the people you come in contact and a magician to society. Well, here you touch the core of my life, the theory of poetry. The air is an organic farm for the practitioners of paradise. Those who are in paradise uh, spread out uh, their joy of life, living it. So if you are in paradise and you can uh, more or less uh, bring forth that idea to other people who are listening to you so that they might be affected by it, then you have people who, instead of waiting for paradise, they are living in paradise. So poetry, as far as I'm concerned, can be on the paper, but it's better when you're, when you're living it. Now, poetry belongs to everybody. Poets think they have a special premium on poetry. Poetry is in everything that exists, in a stone, in a piece of wood, in a human being, in the air, in the sky, anything. So therefore, if you are in touch with all these sources that are part of your life, you are in paradise. Because how many people live and die? Did they find out who the hell they were? What did they want to be? Couldn't be? Well, why, for instance, why did, why, why did I come? What was driving me? 
What was driving me toward all this? Economics, religion, politics, philosophy, poetry, the whole business. I'm driving toward what? What is life for? It's incredible. Vincent's 24 years older than I am. I'm 50 and he's 74. I mean, sometimes I feel that he has twice as much energy as I have. He has tw twice as much, <laughs> twice as much uh, creativity. And I think that's, if you pursue your work, if, if you are, if you're absolutely um, devoted and committed um, to listening to that voice inside you, to, to expressing it, to, to uttering it, uh, to interacting with people uh, through, uh, through that uh, uh, work, um, I think that that's, that's just simply allowing the life force to come through you. In the same way that he's a model to the young, he should be a model to people his own age uh, for living a fulfilled life. Vincent hasn't shut down. If anything, he's opened up. We need people like this to say, no, you don't shut down at the age of 65 or 70. You, you know, your, 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 your veins don't tie off. You know, you're, you're, uh, uh, you still can live vitally, intellectually, physically, sexually. Uh, I think Vincent's a, a living example of it. Now there are two pieces of me, one behind and one in front. Reality is comprised of tremendous amounts of bits, odds and ends. You take your pick, I'll take them all. Every inch of this island is holy. I wake up with it, work with it, sleep with it, dream with it, loving every piece of it and the whole at once. What cannot be taken away, the temple outside me, in me, I am inside of. Life is the poem. Yeah. Why be a piece of the pie when you can be the whole thing? <laughs> <laughs>